Right, good morning or good afternoon, I should say, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Professor Margaret Levy uh, to Rising. Uh, Margaret, or Professor Levy, is arguably the world's top political scientist. Uh, she is a recipient of the Johann uh, Schutte Prize, uh, which is largely regarded as the Nobel Prize of political science. Um, and well, I mean, a list of all of Margaret's achievements would be impossible to list if we're going to have time to talk to her as well. Uh, but here we have a political scientist who has dealt with, at the sort of analytical level, analytical narratives, trying to find uh, the, if you like, the logic of things, and who then has analyzed things ranging from conscription to coffee. So, Professor Levy, uh, welcome to, uh, to Rising. Uh, I think I'd like to start off with um, uh, of this moment in time with some of the research you've been working on before, which talks about legitimacy, when people find government legitimate. Uh, and at, in America this week, we now have a new president elect, and we have a number of people who may not regard that as legitimate rule. And I was wondering if that's a thing you could talk about for us if it's if it's sure it's and and first of all thank you for having me it's a great honor to be part of this conversation with you and be part of the rising um community um i make a distinction in my work i am an academic so i dance on the head of a pin at times i make a distinction between trustworthiness and legitimacy of government so i think in many many ways what we have seen certainly during this election is how trustworthy our government institutions still are um, that we can have confidence at least objectively i'm not saying that people always perceive them that way but we can have some confidence that they're working the way they're supposed to work that they're delivering on their promises that they're being held accountable as we see this stream of litigation uh, against those hardworking ballot counters and hardworking um, state electoral boards uh, throughout the US, we're also learning that unless you have real strong evidence, you can't claim fraud. And that in fact, the systems have been working remarkably well, if slowly, but that's part of the nature of the game. Legitimacy is a different problem. Legitimacy really has to do with the moral justifications for uh, what's going on, for the, the uh, belief that what is happening is right, even if it's correct, you could not think it's right. Um, we've had lots of examples where government has acted the way it should according to laws, but has in fact been quite illegitimate. South Africa is a case in point, the apartheid South of the United States is a case in point. I grew up in the 1950s fighting unjust laws, um, being taken on demonstrations. I sound like Kamala Harris now, take, being taken on demonstrations as a little girl. I'm a lot younger than Kamala Harris. Um, I mean, a lot older, <laughs> sorry, she's a lot younger. Right. Uh, um, but taken on demonstrations, you know, to fight the very unfair and discriminatory laws in my state of Maryland at that time in the city of Baltimore, but all over the country. So legitimacy and trustworthiness are really different things. And what we're seeing in the election is that for some part of the populace, no matter how the vote was, how appropriately the vote is counted, how, uh, how many people were involved, what the outcome is, they can't believe it's legitimate. They just think that this is something's fundamentally wrong with the system that could allow um, Trump to lose. But it strikes me when now talking from one academic to another now, and, and here quoting a third academic, Max Weber, talked in, in his essay about three legitimate types of, or three pure types of legitimacy, uh, about the traditional rule, the bureaucratic, uh, rational rule, and then also the charismatic leader and the charismatic leader who may not uh, actually be a god, but who is perceived to be like that uh, among his followers. Um, and. I was rereading that when I was rereading you. Uh, and, and Max Weber also says, but the problem about the charismatic leader is that once he has not delivered, he falls from grace immediately. And then I, th and I wrote in the margin, no, Max, you are wrong. Uh, and I was wondering if, if you and I here can, can dismiss Max Weber and say, well, actually, the charismatic leader is still regarded as charismatic, even if he doesn't deliver, and what we can do about that. I love being put together with Max Weber. Um, 
so I, I think, you know, when we think about Weber and think about his way of thinking about legitimacy, and I'm very sympathetic to this, it's all about power. These are legitimate forms of power. Um, and the thing about charismatic rule is I think he, he was wrong as he was in a number of places and mm -hmm. right in so many others, um, in part because he put forward propositions that could in fact be tested empirically. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be wrong some of the time. Yes. And that's a good thing. Yes. Um, yes. But, but he, he was really, so he was wrong about charismatic leaders not necessarily falling from power the minute they don't deliver. We, we clearly have seen that that's not true. But the other thing that he argued, which I think is right, is that charismatic leaders can sometimes transform the power that they got charismatically into routinized legal rule. Now, Trump has not done that. He's done the opposite of that in many ways, one could argue. On the other hand, a clearly charismatic le leader like Jesus Christ, even though he did not himself routinize his charisma, others routinized it, the church routinized it on his behalf and created a whole very different kind of legal, if you will, regime as a result of that. So I think the real failure of Trumpism is, we're gonna see, the proof is in the pudding. Um, has his ability to transform the courts of the United States, um, to engage in other kinds of practices that were clearly norm breaking, um, but, and some may prove to be illegal, but many were legal. Um, will they in fact become part of the way in which we govern? I think that if he had gotten a second term, that might have been the case. Um, I think that without a second term, it's very unlikely to be the case. But as I said, the proof is in the pudding. Yes, because it's very interesting when we're talking about the courts, it, and it's been sort of like the playbook of, uh, of, of, um, of getting dictatorial or near dictatorial powers, or, or certainly powers of that ilk, is that you pack the courts. I mean, that was the uh, Fujimori did it in Peru. Uh, we've seen it happening in Poland and in, in, in Hungary lately, and, and also in, in Turkey. So, so, but you would say that in America, it hasn't been possible. I mean, the proof will be in the pudding, but you think the, the assumption is that it hasn't been possible to pack the courts and that some of these judges may do, as it were, an Earl Warren, and once they're in, they just might turn around. As, as indeed we've got no, I, I think the courts have been packed. And, but what I don't know is what the long lasting consequences of that will be, and in terms of other kinds of rules. So I, there's no question that the Federalists have succeeded in their goal the Federalist Society in the United States in their goal of making sure that there is a huge conservative majority and deeply conservative majority in the court system, including the Supreme Court, but not just the Supreme Court. It's all the way down the line. Mm. But what we're seeing, e even with this, these uh, legal cases with the, um, I think it's going to come up with, with issues like abortion and there's some other things that it will really make a difference. And it's clearly going to be um, in more in favor of states' rights than I. You know, there's always a balance there, and they're going to they're going to go in a way I would not prefer. But I think as we're seeing with the ballot uh, cases, with the claims of fraud in vote counting, even very conservative justices are upholding what is clearly the law. Yes. So the law is still there, right? It's a question of the interpretation of the law, and we know that can make a huge difference for certain kinds of issues. For other kinds of issues, the law is pretty straightforward. Um, and unless those laws get changed, which has not fully been the case yet, um, I think, you know, we, as I said, it's, we still need to see how much difference, how much uh, that charisma of Trump has been routinized through the courts, and is that enough to routinize that charisma throughout the whole political system. But it's interesting on, if we can just sort of dwell on the courts for a second, uh, because the courts is a very interesting institution from a political science point of view, because the judges are sort of just behind there. And I think they're, they're, uh, uh, the Chief Justice uh, uh, was uh, quoted as saying that any attempt to analyze the courts was sociological goobly goob. Uh, which was was interesting, but do you think, uh, notwithstanding what the, the the chief justice says, that the courts will also, to a degree, try to reflect the, if you like, the 
the preferences and the views of uh, Americans who, who in many ways have uh, have views that are, that are strikingly liberal, for example, on abortion. Do you think they would take heed that uh, we had spoke to a judge actually the other day who said, well, they, they can't just do anything, uh, but who, it was a throwaway remark. Do you think the courts actually um, are, are res receptive to the views of the of Americans at large, or do you think they just go straight by the book and do what we call black letter law? Well, I think there's a, an additional issue here that you're not mentioning is that you, you mentioned uh, the Warren court and mm. um, how people change positions in that period. They, none of them were originalists. Oh. There's a certain legal doctrine that has now become basically at least three members of the court hold very strongly to it right? At least three, maybe more, are certainly buying into it. But Clarence Thomas is an originalist and now uh, Neil Gorsuch and um, our newest Supreme Court justice. Um, so that's a very different interpretation of the law hmm. that, I'm, that worries me considerably um, about how that will take the court and whether it can be as responsive to the changing conditions of a society I mean, that was what the Warren Court tried to do, was to understand the law within the context of a, of a world that was different than the world of 1789, early 19th century. Um, but that's not clearly what these three justices will do. And they make up a large proportion of the court who can sway one, possibly two others. Um, so it's, it, so it makes me nervous. Yes. So do we, it's not just mourning in America, if I can quote a former governor of uh, right. of, the, of your state, who, who probably would not be best pleased. I don't know actually what he would be, uh, but that's that's by, a little bit by the by. In, if I could just move on to to slightly uh, an, another part of your of your work, uh, you were, wrote a book with uh, John Alquist. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. You did. I said it with a Swedish kind of intonation, uh, uh, which was called "In the Interest of Others," and what uh, I mean, it, I, far be it for me to try to summarize it in, in one sentence, but which I'm then going to do now. Uh, but one of the things you, you look at there is the sort of when people go beyond material interest, they would do things that actually materially uh, would, uh, would not benefit them. Uh, and as I'm looking at America from afar, uh, and also as I'm looking at our own situation, namely Brexit, uh, I've seen a number of situations where people sort of seem to say, well, you know, what is really important is this. And I was wondering if, if you can sort of reflect a little bit on, on that, uh, this ability of people sometimes to go, be, move beyond their material interests and do things uh, notwithstanding and still be, as it were, rational individuals. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So we see lots of evidence, lots of evidence of people acting outside their material self-interest, often um, on behalf of people that they love and care deeply about, right? That's, that's a fairly easy case. There, there are, of course, sociopaths and psychopaths who don't do that, but you know, most of us would certainly um, make some sacrifices, even considerable sacrifices on behalf of a, a loved one, even in a, and. Many of us have extended families. So what we were really interested in in that book is how do you not only create an expanded and inclusive and robust community of faith, enabling people to recognize like we do with our families that our fates are entwined with each other, that our destinies are enmeshed so that you think in a way about those distant others, some of whom are strangers and who cannot reciprocate in the same way you think about making sacrifices for your family members, right? That you think that it's worth, because we're so entwined with each other, we have to help each other out. Now, how that's, we see that happening, you know, big massive protests of various kinds, right, left, middle, the ones for climate change are a great example where people are, um, you know, acting in, if it's in their interest, it's in their very long term interest. It's not necessarily in their immediate material interest. They're thinking outside the box. Greta Thunberg, talk about a charismatic leader, has been incredibly effective in mobilizing not only young people, but lots of other people to get off their, if you, their derrieres and begin to engage in some action 
around those questions, even if it costs them something in time, in money, in um, maybe even in danger, depending on where they're demonstrating and, and what they're doing. What we found in that book that what maintains that, what helps create it and what maintains it is a set of institutional arrangements or governance arrangements for an organization, for a government, we were looking at unions, but unions as many governments that actually help people to learn about those distant others and the kinds of circumstances that they're in. So, and debate with each other about the information so that the issue of false information becomes less relevant. Um, and which um, gives them a right to then decide whether or not the collective will act in a way that could be very costly to the individuals in the collective, may lose them their jobs, may get them in, you know, again, time, money, danger. Um, and we found that there are institutional arrangements and there are democratic practices that can facilitate that. It starts often with a very trustworthy leader or leadership group, sort of think about the founding moments of the US constitution. There's some founding parents <laughs> um, who have uh, worked together to create a new constitutional situation, which holds their feet to the fire and doesn't allow them to be unaccountable and is very enduring. But most important, produces a kind of democratic participation that allows people to learn, to understand their relationships to others, and then to act in ways that enable them to feel what my friend Elizabeth Wood calls the pleasure of agency. They can feel efficacious, which is another, you know, that's, a, that's the positive. So they're acting rationally, they're acting collectively, they've made these decisions, but they're not acting narrowly economically or economistically. And if rationality means acting only in your narrow self-interest, then they're not rational. If it means making a, a good decision based on the information and then knowing what the costs and benefits are, they're acting very rationally indeed. But I, I, it, it strikes me when you were saying that, I was actually thinking of Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, at The Active Life, which is also where she has a, uh, and takes a swing at the French Revolution, says but it was all about material interest, whereas the American one was about creating a, uh, a public. But that's just one academic to another. And we're just name dropping here, I guess. Uh, but I, I was just I think sort it's of- It's also true that they're almost always in big events or things that matter. They're, I mean, I, one of the things that's interesting about the unions and, and one of the reasons we studied them is the only way these things succeed if the economic interests are also satisfied. So if the union leadership is losing in every bargaining negotiation and the workers are get, getting losses in income and benefits and hours, then they won't probably act in the interest of others. It depends on the capacity of the government to deliver to its own. So you're acting in your, your economic interest is largely or partially satisfied and that's part of the process. And those acts of solidarity can become quite useful as it turns out um, in other kinds of times when you have to be solidaristic in pushing for your demands. So I never believed that it was one or the other, economic interest or total selflessness. Most cases, it's a combination of the two. Enough of your economic interest or material interest is satisfied so that you can act in a different way. When you, know, when you look at the history of uh, conscientious objection, France had like one conscientious objector when the laws were so tight that you basically you know, went to jail, went to prison for life. The US had very few when our laws were very tight and when you knew that you'd be beaten up by the military when you actually went to be, do your conscientious objection work. When those institutions got looser, a lot more people seemed to reveal their preferences to um, engage in conscientious objection. But where we are now, it seems if we just, I mean, if we just take the unions, even the Scandinavian countries where they have the sort of unionization percentage of over 90 at the beginning of the, of, well, the mid 1980s, they're now down to, to sort of the high 60s uh, on the latest count. And, and a number of places, even the places that had that sort of system 
Sweden, for example, Norway, Denmark, and so on, uh, they no longer have that. And the sort of the solidarity kind of feeling, I think the the, uh, the Swedish TUC had a, a slogan, become solidaric with yourself, uh, which rather <laughs> uh, which rather undermines the, the whole idea. Uh, I think they then dropped it because somebody pointed out the, the irrationality of the semantics there. Uh, but it strikes me, uh, and in Britain, of course, we've had uh, Margaret Thatcher's so-called reforms, uh, what could also called an assault on, on those rights, and the institutional uh, framework that, that underpinned those have sort of gone fallen by the wayside. And it's, it, it strikes me that we are now much more back to, to, to a society where people are not really willing to do that, and we're becoming sort of less likely to, to follow uh, that and, and is that a, a result of, of, of institutions that have just been been eroded, if you like, over the past years? And, are there, uh, and more positively, are there things we can do institutionally to? Uh... Well, I think there are two things going on at once here. So yes, the unions have been in most, not all, but most countries that have had free unions, um, they have been eroded, and their numbers have decreased, and their capacities have been um, undermined by new laws and regimes. And I think, and that I think doesn't necessarily affect solidarity everywhere, but I think it's a really problematic um, development for, for democracy because we have various ways in which we express our voice and therefore achieve anything even closely approaching the notion of equal consideration of each of us. And one of them obviously is through the vote, but another is through organizations that represent us and can collectively um, help mobilize us to vote, help use our resources to lobby, to do other kinds of things. And we have seen the erosion of many of those kinds of organizations. I mean, this is, this is Robert Putnam's argument yeah. in part, we're falling alone much more than we used to. Um, and that is really disturbing. And that's, I think it, it undermines democracy and a, and a critical capacity of democracy to at least begin to approach something like equal consideration. So on the other hand, you know, I have seldom been more pleased with the American public than in this last election. Not everybody voted the way I would have chosen, but so many people voted. And it was costly for many of them to vote. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's literally dangerous to go outside and to stand in a line, even at social distance. But for that long a period that many of them had to stand in line, they were many were fighting, certainly African-Americans and some of the Latino population not the Cuban Latinos, but some of the other Latinos were fighting um, really serious efforts at voter suppression, you know, moving ballot boxes and polling places around and doing everything that one could to try to block people from voting. And yet they paid, they sacrificed, they paid the cost. That was, they weren't acting in their narrow material interest to do that. I mean, what the return to them individually will be is still open. I mean, no exact promises were made for those votes. So they were spending their time, their resources, sacrificing money in some cases, if they you know, had jobs that they had to do and had to stand in line for 10 hours um, and possibly experiencing danger because there were, as we know, there's a lot of other stuff going on in the mm. United States. Right? So I, I see that as a kind of expanded community of fate. Now, whether that again can get turned into an organizational capacity and be governed in a way that encourages it and sustains it is an open question. There are a lot of open questions here, but there are also lots of reasons for hope again, um, not just the election outcome itself, but the way in which the election was carried out. So when, when you mentioned Robert Putnam before, I, I was actually thinking about sort of one step further back, I've compared you to Weber, and now I'll compare you to Tocqueville. Uh, because what you were writing about in, in, in the book with, with John was about this overcoming thing. And I think Tocqueville, a little bit along the lines of Putnam, actually talked about uh, you uh, you learn democracy by practicing it, I think you see, I mean, I'm right. trying, paraphrasing it. Uh, and, and his point was that America has exactly the same constitution as Mexico, but it doesn't work in Mexico's 
because in Mexico they have uh, a, a just different norms. Everything is top down, and the Americans will have been part of civic associations, uh, and right. they learn it by going to meetings, and they know they can't right. decide anything under AOB and and all these other things. And, and I was wondering when when you were saying the things about people standing in line. That's fairly atomistic. I mean, they don't. I mean, they go out there. They 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 they're fired up and all the rest of it, but they don't really enter the laboratory or this of the or the or the junior high school of democracy and learn it by by having those negotiations and debates and 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 you know they again they're they're, they're bowling you, alone. Give them a chance. They've been yeah. you know this for many of them. This was first of all you couldn't do that in these circumstances. The pandemic uh -huh. is undermining that possibility, right? But still the amount of interaction that's been going on and conversations that have been going on and um, groups that have been forming and activity. I mean, there, there were a lot of people who still did door to door canvassing on both sides, more Republicans because they were less fearful of the pandemic, but certainly lots of Democrats too. So there were lots of people beginning those steps. And as soon as this pandemic lifts, let's hope it does, um, I think we'll see a lot of people engaging in ways that they haven't before. Even that single act, that kind of commitment gives you a taste for uh, the joy of civic engagement. And, and also, actually, that was the point I want for sort of to, to come back, which is a point of hope, really, is that we have sort of a digital kind of uh, democracy in America. And a lot of people have established digital forum or fora, I suppose it's called. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and it's sort of Tocqueville in the in the um, in cyberspace, if you like. Well, it has to be at the moment. But yes, there are lots of experiments with that and lots of really amazing things going on. Uh, so. Again, I'm sorry we're sort of you know jumping on sort of like getting through your uh, your greatest works as it were. Uh, I'm not going to go into to to coffee and all of that. But those I, I find it interesting that you've written about that too. Uh, but one of the other things that you're you're known for is about the public sector and uh, and uh, and of course the uh, supply chains uh, in, in for, for for better or for worse. Uh, but I was wondering if if I can sort of turn to you as a public policy kind of person or public administration kind of person. Uh, and look at the at the state as an organization if that's capable of delivering for people because uh, it's at the moment we have a number of things that are almost impossible and I think close to where you were there was uh, a study from uh, uh, Pressman and Wildorski back in the day about implementation saying you know I can't yeah. remember the whole title about uh, great hopes in Washington get dashed in Oakland why it's amazing the federal programs work at all uh, and I was wondering if if with that hat on uh, if you think that there is a problem in America because there, there will have to be a number of decisions uh, in taken in Washington that would have to percolate down and the question is, is the government, is the public sector capable of, uh, of, of actually implementing anything? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting question. It, and it's, um, I can't say that I'm particularly expert on it, but yeah. my, my, but I'll talk. <laughs> but, but my sense is that, um, this is going to be a hard, hard to explain. So, I mean, I think what's happened since Thatcher, really, and Reagan, is there has been a hollowing out of the public sector and a loss of confidence in it as a result of that hollowing out, in part because of that hollowing out, but not only because of that. I don't want to only leave it at that. I think we also, both of our countries, frankly, get extremely bureaucratic. We get caught in our own rules. And those rules need to be rethought periodically. I mean, I think Locke was right that every 20 years, we need to really, every generation, we need to rethink some of the ways we've been doing things. Not total revolution, but really, you know, serious rethinking and reimagining of some of our institutional arrangements. We haven't really done that since Thatcher and Reagan. And what Trump has done and what Boris Johnson is doing is just hollowing things out more. Now that may turn out to be an advantage because as we may now be able to rethink things because we sort of have to, um, we're being compelled to. And we're seeing that the political economic framework that we've been living with since that period is now fraying as they do every 
20, 30, 40 years. This one's had a long life. Um, and it's really not quite the thing that Reagan and Thatcher had in mind or Milton Friedman for that matter, um, those many years ago in the 50s, 60s, and then routinized in the 80s. So I think we're at a very crucial moment where, and, and this is a long-winded answer to your question, but I do think that we can find new paths to have government really work for us. And again, the engaged citizenry is part of that. The activated citizenry at the ballot box means they might be also activated to petition, to demand, to hold um, people's feet to the fire in a different kind of way. I don't just mean through litigation, you know, but I mean through those old practices of going to city hall meetings and trying to find out what's going on and making demands. I live in Seattle um, and commute to Stanford and the streets were filled this summer. I have to say it was frustrating to me. It was the first demonstration in my life I don't think I've joined that was certainly close to me, but given my age and COVID, it just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, but my heart was there. But you know, there were, there were demands um, about reforming the police, which are now gonna begin to be put into practice. I don't mean defunding the police, that's silly. Yeah. But you know, rethinking what the role of the police is and what it should be doing in a city. And that's happening in a variety of levels. You know, the education system needs some rethinking. A lot of our bureaucracies do, um, even apart from their hollowing out and their lack of delivery. We can enable them to deliver again. We have to rethink it. I'm very excited by some of the people who are on Trump's uh, policy group um, who are thinking about these issues. I know several of them. And but they're Biden, just the people. But Biden's, I think. Biden's, sorry. Yeah, Did yeah. I say Trump? Yes, but sorry. Uh, I, I was about to say, who, who would that be exactly? But that's- uh, right. that... No, Biden's, Biden's, um, sorry. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> Trump's in our head. He won't get out of our heads. I, I know, um, it's a Freudian thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but anyway, to... the new president, the incoming president's um, transition team looks really exciting. Are there sort of household names that we should look out for for those of us who are compulsive watchers of America, just, just as, as an aside? No, uh, they're not all household names. I mean, some are better known than others. So uh, Xavier D'Souza Briggs is one of the people running the, who was the vice president of the Ford Foundation, is no longer, um, is, is one of the people running the policy group. My friend Carrie Chihok from King County Government is part of that group of former CASPIS fellow. Zav happens to be on the board of CASPIS of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. Um, Heather Boucher, who's part of our moral political economy group and a wonderful, wonderful woman and economist um, is a key player in advising Biden, got it right that time, on uh, economic policy. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who used to be the, uh, in the, in the, uh, Obama government has been advising. I don't, I'm not sure she'll go into government again, but she's certainly been part of who people have been talking with. These are people I have immense respect for and a lot of confidence in. And there are also people, as is Biden, as is Kamala Harris, people who understand that you don't get things done by demanding them. You get things done by bringing, creating a consensus, getting an understanding, negotiating, maybe giving a little where you'd rather not in order to get something bigger in return. So I think we're back to politics in the old fashioned way of it's a give and take and a lot of discussion and a lot of negotiation and things don't happen quite as fast as we'd like them to, but they slowly happen in the right direction we want them to be going in. Well, that also, last year we had a, a chap called Dane Waters who used to, to run McCain's uh, 2008 campaign, obviously a Republican, uh, and we've spoken to him on a number of occasions. He then uh, actually declared that he had voted for Biden and helped fund the Lincoln Project. Uh, right. and, uh, and, and also, yes, and, and, and uh, Billy Crystal is another one who uh, we've been in touch with, uh, uh, as a potential speaker, he uh, was. He said he was rather busy this year for reasons we uh, we can probably all understand. But uh, I remember Bill Crystal, of course, was Bill Crystal was the man who who derailed the first Health Care Act, and then uh, and was chief of staff for for Dan Quayle, if we can remember that uh, individual, uh, potato potato. Uh, but I, I was wondering, for Biden, would he also have to be uh, including? 
if you like, palatable Republicans or open-minded uh, big tent Republicans in his administration. Uh, remember, Bill Clinton appointed Cohen as Defense Secretary, even if he, well, was he might. I mean, I know that Cindy McCain is on his literal transition team. Yes, she's one of the chief advisors. Um, since you mentioned McCain, he's always, you know, but we have a lot of experience with Biden. He was in the Senate for a very long time, and he was very good at crossing the aisle when he needed to to try mm -hmm. to make friends and make colleagues. So I think that's possible. Um, you know, I think he's got a number, it's gonna be a tough, it's gonna to be tough. We've already talked about the courts. There are really activated constituencies of all kinds out there, left, right, extremist, uh, moderates, all kinds. Um, so he's gonna be able to talk to almost all of them, at least the ones that are important for particular decisions um, and bring them on board and bring the other side into that conversation as well. So it's not gonna be easy. Uh, I mean, I think these, these problems and the fraying of our political economic framework pre-existed before COVID and pre-existed before Donald Trump. Um, so, you know, they've only been made worse, not better, but they're, they've been there for a while. And so it's really time now to take some action, but it's going to be hard. We've dug but ourselves in a deep hole. But I suppose, again, as an outside observer and, and not as an American, one of the books I, uh, as a university student here, had to read about America was Samuel Huntington's book about the promise of disharmony, where, uh, again, to sum it up very quickly, was that that's kind of the point, that we disagree and we have uh, the checks and balances, and the disharmony is the, uh, is the engine that keeps it going. So, so. Uh, I mean, far be it from me to to suicide Huntington, whom I disagree with in a number of ways. Uh, but but in a way, uh, in a way, that's what you signed up for back in the day. And American politics is just overcoming those things and not getting stuck in them. That's right. And I think that's I, I think that we have a chance with Biden and Harris, who understand normal politics, that we you know that we're going to disagree, and that's part of the process. And you win some, and you lose some. Uh, and then with that, I would like to, to segue into our last little segment here in, uh, in the conversation, which is about hope. So what we've been asking people both this year and last year, we uh, asked Julia Gillard, former Prime Minister of Australia, Marina Litvinenko, whose husband was murdered by the KGB, uh, what uh, were the reasons where they were uh, hopeful and what were the things they were not so hopeful about. So what, what is the thing, if we can start with the not so hopeful, what is, what is the thing that worries you? And then after that, what gives you hope? I think that the thing that worries me the most is that climate change is happening faster than humans are willing to admit. And our participation in that process is problematic at best, that's a kind word. Um, and we better start listening to the kids, to Greta Thunberg and the rest of them and get, do something about this. And I am worried, this is where the disharmony in countries like the US really come into play. I am worried that even with the best intentions, it's gonna be really, really tough. Um, these are different kinds of material interests. It's not just individuals, it's corporate interests, which have a whole different logic to them. Mm -hmm. that are part of the problem. It's, it's the, the kinds of, you know, one of the things that I study and I'm deeply interested in understanding much better is why people get the beliefs they get and why they hold them the way they do and why they become impermeable to facts. And we've seen that with climate change. We've seen that with COVID. We've seen that with a number of other things where it's really to their detriment and to the world's detriment for them to hold those really problematic beliefs. Um, even if you can understand, begin to understand where they might have come from. I'm not talking about who you vote for. I'm talking about, you know, denying the science about climate or about COVID or about a whole bunch of other things like that. So that worries me. I see that as very troubling. Um, and I see a lot of the social media encouraging that, not discouraging that. And just real quick, the, 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 the reason why they hold these beliefs in a sentence, why is that? I wish I understood it better, Matt. I really do. Um, you know, a part of it is very contextual. It's it's who your who your community is. Um, uh, part of it is social media manipulation. Part of it is 
is, I think, self-interest in the sense that, you know, you'd rather not have the world be that way. So you just believe it's not that way. It's a weird kind of self-interest or self-perception. I think psychologists and political scientists and other social scientists are beginning to make headway on these questions. I'd like to see us speed that up. A little warp mm. speed on that one would be good because mm. we need to solve this problem if we're going to get herd immunity. Once we get a virus, we've got to get everybody to take that vaccine. Yes. I mean, once we get the vaccine, we've got to take get everybody to take it. Yes. Um, so, so that's what I'm, I'm worried about. That's what I'm worried about. And then on to the finale, what is your hope? And, and I'm, I'm hoping as well also, uh, or I'm assuming, or I'm asking, do you think that there's uh, hope is, is, is ahead on the balance sheet? But first of all, what is your hope, the reason for being hopeful? Well, my hope is really that we can move to a new political economic framework and one that really makes values that matter to most of us part of it. Every political economy has values embedded in it. And I would like to see us care more about the flourishing of people and the earth and uh, less about national economic growth or narrow well-being. Um, so really to think about the well-being of lots of people. And I think we are on the cusp of creating that new political economic framework. Um, and I'm very optimistic that, uh, I mean, the US has certainly lost standing in the world, but it's still a big player. And I think if we can begin to make some real movement in that area, and other countries are as well, um, we can really create you know, a shift in a very different direction about uh, how we do our politics, how we do our economics, what our corporations are all about. There's a wonderful project that the British Academy is running on the purposeful corporation, really rethinking the corporation. I mean, all of that is part of um, you know, creating a new moral political economy. There are lots of groups thinking about that, pushing to particular things, beginning to make changes that are positive. And some of them are a little below the radar, which is probably a good thing. Um, and some of them are, you know, big think kinds of questions that we really have to address. So that's uh, just on, on the on the corporation one part of that paradigm shift that you're talking about is on also moving away from the the corporation as defined by Milton Friedman as an organization that that's is right. just there to make money uh, and is also there for the well-being of individuals. Well, the the argument of of Friedman was that the only people to serve were the were the shareholders. The argument that's now being made is that there's the stakeholders as well which is a much more encompassing notion that includes the workers and includes us who are consumers or affected, sometimes beneficiaries, sometimes the harmed by corporate practice. And on that note, Professor Levy, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I, for, for one, feel much more hopeful and I'm sure the other people here uh, are feeling more hopeful as well. Uh, and uh, I of hope course so. <laughs> well, I, I hope so too. Uh, and we'll actually find out now. We, of course, we pre recorded this one, so this is not happening in real time. Uh, but in a second, you will be there live with us, and I will be here live, and we'll take questions from people. And, uh, and hopefully, people will, will share our hopefulness. Uh, so it's been, been wonderful. So. Thank you very much for taking time to talk. Thank to you. Us. Wonderful to talk to you. Good morning, Margaret. Uh, I Good morning. I believe it is about eight o'clock in the morning, eight twenty-two, eight thirty. Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, we really appreciate you being up so impossibly early for us. Uh, I, I take it you didn't drive all the conference, which I started at 6 a.m. my time. Oh, okay, good, because I was just afraid you'd driven all the way down from Oregon, uh, which I, well, I probably didn't actually think that. So it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, it was uh, great to talk to you. I feel very enlightened after that. And I was actually quite hopeful after our conversation. Uh, I can see that uh, America has moved slightly forward in the meantime. Uh, other people didn't seem to have received that particular memo uh, but we don't going to go into to any details about this now at this stage uh, people were uh, can ask questions we have a question and answer session uh, here uh, somebody says thank you for the interview it's an anonymous attendee which is fine uh, and the individual says has a question about the impact of fear on political participation 
Uh, it says, during this presidential election, it appears that many people voted Biden not because they necessarily liked him or his program, but rather because they disliked or feared or even hated Donald Trump. Similar, in a way, fear is used by Trump to mobilize his support base. Can antagonism, polarization, and fear ever be beneficial to a democracy? Uh, that is the question. And uh, Margaret, I don't know what you think about it. Well, I, I, the fact is uh, fear and polarization have been part of democracies everywhere almost since they began. It's uh, you know negative campaigning and uh, demonizing the opposition have unfortunately always been part of politics and probably always will be to some extent. The question it seems to me is that we want to minimize that and we need to find ways to engage in a more civil politics. A lot of our institutional arrangements in not only in the United States, but in a, the United States is particularly bad on this because of the campaign finance rules that we have um, tend to encourage um, certain kinds of groups to take dominance and to then uh, create that kind of uh, fear politics. But that's, we can find different institutional arrangements and we can find a more civil discourse. And I do think the leadership has some effect on that. And that in the last four years in the United States, and we're not alone in this, um, unfortunately, I, I wish Brazil didn't suffer from the same disease and to some extent, Britain and a few other countries around the world, where we've had leadership who feels that the way, best way to lead is to demonize the other side, to create um, fear. So it's not surprising that 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 polarization and fear mongering appears in the electoral process itself. I think with different leadership, we can hopefully, hopefully see less of that, but ultimately it's both an institutional problem and a problem of creating forms of engagement that give people voice in ways that don't require them to just make this, this or that kind of case. So um, I'm gonna make a little, uh, push here for a, a video that or a, um, a webcast that's coming up at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences on ways to build better democratic institutions. It'll, it'll be on November 19th. And it features, among others, uh, Jim Fishman, who has done a whole series, those of you who read the New York Times might have seen the report on the deliberative um, processes that he created in uh, nationally in a forum and brought together people with very disparate political views and they actually be moderated their views, um, came to understand each other, came to have a different way of talking to each other and that sustained itself uh, over the course of the year. This was a follow-up on that group of people. Jenny Mansbridge will be talking about various ways in which um, institutional arrangements can promote uh, better deliberative processes and a more civil discourse. So tune in on November 19th to that. Yes, I, 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 uh, and you mentioned uh, a number of people there that are uh, very prominent. We have a question from, uh, from Sam, uh, who says, thanks for the interview. I'd like Professor Levy to briefly talk about what the idea of, uh, quote, uh, the pleasure of agency means and the source of it, I didn't quite hear who is the proponent of it. That's a very short and to the point question, which is admirable, by the way. I thank, I thank you. Um, so the person who first introduced the term, as far as I know, uh, the pleasure of agency is Elizabeth Wood, who is a political scientist based at Yale. And she was talking about insurgencies in uh, Central America in talking about it and figuring out why people engaged in various ways. And one of the things that she found and that John Alquist and I found in our book, In the Interest of Others, is that the first part of why people are willing to do things that are incredibly costly, engage in very costly actions, is not, it's not, it can't be simply based on incentives because the costs are very high. So it can't be a simple cost benefit calculation. Um, and, and there is an emotional, piece of it. So there's a rationality piece, but there's also an emotionally supportive piece of it. 
uh, that has to do with once you engage in action and if you feel like you're being somewhat efficacious, you actually get pleasure from mm. being an mm. agent in your own fate and in, in the processes that you're participating in. And that's a positive feedback, which becomes a benefit um, that overrides some of the costs that people face in engaging in those kinds of actions. Uh, excellent. Yes, it's, it's interesting that some people come around to that. I think the late Robert Nozick, who started off with Anarchy, State and Utopia, uh, his last book uh, was a book called The Nature of Rationality, where he belatedly came around to the same thing. But, you know, repentant sinners is a thing we like, especially as it normally takes place in the church. Uh, the uh, Dave uh, has, uh, or Dave Hirons, uh, has another question. Uh, and the question goes, Sergei Levrov, my Russian is not very good, I think it's pronounced correctly, Sergei Levrov, the Russian Foreign Secretary, said this week that, that he considers the US electoral system to be archaic, to be archaic as it distorts the will of the people, as, which is quite rich coming from him, by the way. Uh, as many of the Western democracies are now polarized on a 50-50 split, how can we believe any longer that a country's uh, country's people can have a united will and does this uh, prefigure the end of democracy as alternatives are considered to be more effective in managing the desires and expectations of society so basically uh, we uh, we have a, uh, we have a gridlock and therefore democracy goes out of the window uh, and I think there was a novel in 1935 by that was called it, uh, it can happen here where they speculate that exactly that particular uh, is Sinclair Lewis won the Nobel Prize, the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So was Sinclair Lewis right, 50-50, and then we have to get a strong man in. I think Sinclair Lewis even said that his dictator had a strange hairdo, but that's another one. <laughs> well, first of all, I think in this case, uh, we can say that Lavrov doesn't understand democracy, that having a 50-50 split is we never believed in the unified will of the people. All of our institutional arrangements are set up to protect from the tyranny of the majority to they've actually now increased the tyranny of the minority, I would argue mm -hmm. in some ways. So that's, that's a different kind of concern than the founding all fathers of the, uh, at least the American form, US form of democracy uh, had in mind. But we've never thought that the will of the people is totally reflected in the vote. And we've always had representative institutions that enable that to be moderated to some extent. So there's election, even the president who is elected by all of the people, that was also meant to be uh, done originally through the state legislatures, um, not through a direct, totally direct vote. So that's why we have an electoral college um, and it had different ways in which uh, the electors could be chosen initially. So we've evolved as democracies. So that's one piece of the question. The piece of the question that um, a 50-50 split uh, by itself does not doom democracy. Um, it just means that it puts more pressure on the representatives and on the president to actually be as our president elect is saying to be the president of all the people and not just uh, the people who elected him um, to forget about these division that's part of the role of the president and that what those voices are telling him who voted against him were that there are other things to consider than what's in his platform um, so i think that's a really positive uh, piece of democracy the other side of it is uh, the systems that we have to increase gridlock. It's particularly true in the US, but it's not unknown in other places. There are incredible veto points in virtually every political system, which gives certain people capacity to block changes, um, very significant changes that we care about. So even when there wasn't gridlock in the United States, um, you had a group of Southern senators who were able to block virtually through a different set of rules um, any advances on racial justice until there was some very big massive mobilization um, on behalf of racial justice in the US in the 1950s and 60s uh, culminating in the, in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
So I think, you know, gridlock is a problem, but so there is that kind of, their veto points are equally important problems and democracy evolves and it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an organic process. And we, we keep creating new problems for ourselves and then having to figure out how to solve them. And I think that's where we are now. Penny is asking, what steps do you think we need, need to be taken in order to eliminate voter suppression and engage the electorate in the next four years so that the turnout remains as good as this elect election cycle so that we can keep this momentum of participation going? That's a, a, one again, a, an admirably short question. Uh, I know you'd have a, 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 a succinct answer to that. Um. I think we we listen to Stacey Abrams, who seems to be brilliant at figuring out how to overcome voter suppression and increase engagement. Um, for those of you who don't know her, she was a candidate for governor of Georgia, and she and an organization that she created um, after she lost that election by fifty thousand votes or so, um, in a in a situation in which a lot of black votes were basically suppressed, you know, part of so part of it is the voter suppression. Part of it is this was a particularly. Th this goes back to Sam's question in a way. Um, there was so much antagonism to Trump and so much enthusiasm for Trump that that also um, I think uh, increased the turnout and made this a much more momentous election than many are seen as being. Um, so I think that's that's part of the story here. But there are ways to to prevent voter suppression. Uh, I think one of the questions it's uh, it's the uh, it's uh, Dave's question actually on the uh, on the fifty fifty split and the. Uh, and, 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 and that's sort of like the gridlock kind of thing uh, and as if antagonism is a problem, but isn't it almost, I mean, I, I, I hate to, to cite uh, Carl Schmitt, the uh, rather controversial at every level, uh, um, well, German uh, legal theorist who, who once said that politics is a sphere where you distinguish between friend and enemy. And, and I was wondering whether it isn't part of the, the the fabric, if you like, of politics of, of that antagonism and, and, and politics being the sphere in some ways where it might not be friend and enemy, but then at least uh, friend and opponent. And it always has to be a messy compromise is almost the, the given in a democracy, uh, which is like a thing that is suboptimal, but still, still preferable to, to, to all of the chaos. But I was just wondering whether politics isn't almost it's nature an antagonistic business. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be totally uncivil. No, I mean, it is no. it is antagonistic. Yes, there's there's something to be won at the end. I mean, people are fighting for votes and they're fighting um, to be in office. And there are very um, consequential policies sometimes at stake in which people have very different investments and views. Mm -hmm. So by its very nature, absolutely politics is um, going to be antagonistic. But that as I, as I keep repeating, it doesn't have to be an antagonism. So in the, I'll again go back to, to the study um, that I did with John Alquist of the unions. In the cases of the decisions that were being made by the unions that chose to do this, to um, act in the interest of others, it was done through a process in which people voted. You didn't just, the leadership didn't just tell people that they were closing the ports. The membership had to go along with that and they had to argue about it. And they succeeded in having, and sometimes there were really intense debates. We documented this, I mean, it looks like American or any other democracy where people have really, really distinctive views. I mean, if you think about the late the dock workers unions of the 1930s and 40s there were communists and there were anti-communists and there were people who cared very intensely in very different ways it was a very heterogeneous uh, community and yet they recognized that the process worked mm. so the confidence in the process meant that they knew they might lose this one they had a chance of winning the other one it meant marshalling their arguments it meant you know, getting bigger coalitions, 
It meant engaging in a political process in order to win what they wanted to win, but it didn't mean that they were, they could, still could work together. They mm. still could um, lift those heavy, heavy loads together and work as teams, even though they disagreed uh, in other ways politically and had lo just lost an important battle as far as they were concerned. Mm. Well, so we have in political science, we've had people who talked about oppositions like Bob Dahl back in the day, more recently with Cara Strom and uh, Todd Donovan talked about Luther's consent and, and, and consent and all of that. Uh, but at the same time, just as I was, uh, I was, as I was talking to you, your phone always comes up with these sort of new alerts and the Guardian had a story where they said uh, the Democrats are taking a knife to a gunfight uh, and I said and you sort of say well you need to be civil uh, but isn't it a little bit difficult to be civil if no if I'm not saying you need to be civil no I'm not saying you need to be civil I'm saying we can achieve greater civility yes but that requires some people to start being a wee bit more civil I suppose but uh, well, I think I think we do have a serious problem in some of our polities, and the U.S. is a very good mm. example of this. I don't want to just be U.S. centric, no, no, no. but it, it's clearly on the top of my mind right now. I was reading um, the review of Obama's uh, new memoir. Yeah. I haven't actually read the book yet, which just came out. Um, and one of the things that he says there is how McConnell. Uh, Mitch McConnell, who is the, uh, as I believe you all know, um, is the Senate Majority Leader and has been instrumental and fundamental to um, changing the court system and to blocking all kinds of efforts uh, by the by many of his constituents and and uh, other members of the Senate as well as by the Democratic members of the Senate. Um, that that McConnell only thought about power and holding on to power and winning the game. He didn't really care, about, he doesn't really care about the de democratic process. And I think when we have that kind of problem, which was not the problem that I was uh, addressing in the labor union uh, case, but when we have people with that kind of power who have that kind of perspective and that perspective which was really in large part created by um, the Koch brothers and others pouring money into that kind of process. Uh, then we do have a problem that I think does mean that the other side either has to step up and fight fire with fire, or there has to be some way of changing the system so that the kind of ways in which um, McConnell is acting and being reinforced mm. can't happen. And that will require some significant institutional change and incentive change. Good, I can see that we don't have any more questions though the ones we did have were uh, succinct and Excellent. to the point. Yes, uh, unlike mine, that were a bit wobbly, but there we go. Uh, no. That goes with being a political science professor in England as opposed to in America. Um, so, uh, Margaret, this has been uh, an honor, actually. It's, it's great to meet you, albeit virtually. We really do hope that you've come actually to Coventry because we... That would be nice. Uh, I was looking forward to it. Yes, I, I think I think if we can change that slight subjunctive clause of your sentence there and say that will be nice, then I will hereby issue you an invitation to come to Coventry. Uh, Thank you. And uh, we also uh, <clears throat> we don't have much Aboriginal art. I know that's your speciality and and, and also an interest of mine. But uh, we do have a number of other cultural things. Of course, we're capital of culture in Britain oh. next year, so it will be obvious to have you here. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude this by thanking you.